Okay, so good morning, lunchtime, whatever you want to call it. So I want to talk a little bit about OpenThread as a solution for like power effective or pow low power IP, IP connectivity. So my name is Stefan. I'm working at the Huawei Open Source Technology Center. Um, I have a long background in open source. I started working like 2005. I started to look into like kernel development and stuff like that. And over the last six, seven, eight years or something, I'm one of the co-maintainers of the 15.4 uh, subsystem in the Linux kernel, which is not used in this talk, but I have a lot of like 15.4 background and so on in this, in this area. So what is the agenda for what, what I want to talk a little bit about today? So giving a little bit of a scope to make sure what, what I want to talk and what is not part of it, so we all know that and what you can expect. I want to talk a little bit about the, the power budget we are talking about here. So because everybody's like saying like embedded, IoT, everybody has like very different opinions. It's a, it's a huge range of things that could be labeled as embedded IoT, right? So then I will talk a little bit of open thread, giving an overview. So I don't know, maybe some people have background in that, some maybe not. So like setting a baseline here to have like a basic understanding. Then I have a few words on like bare metal versus uh, real-time operating system versus Linux. So also especially on, on how, how I used it. And then I go a bit more into the technical details of what OpenThread is using in, in terms of technology. So one of that is six Lopen. I will talk about that, what it is and how it is used. And also things like uh, multicast DNS discovery and service registration protocol, which are more like new developments in, in Thread to also help on the power side. And I will closing down with like some uh, talking a little bit of the, of the work I did over the last year in form of a transparent gateway blueprint using these kind of technologies and just one slide about an upcoming standard called Meta that might be relevant in that space later on. Okay, so let's go. Um, low power, low rate wireless. So that is like, low rate means I'm not talking about like video uh, streaming or not something like that. I'm talking about like a few bytes, sensor data being sent back and forth. So that's like what, what I'm talking about. And I want to make that very power efficient. So actually I can run the device on a coin cell battery for like years and not like just a day or a week or something like that. I'm also talking about IP version six end to end. Um, this is something that is very much to my heart. So. Um, there are a lot of solutions there for low power and so on that give you a lot of um, characteristics and uh, possibilities, but they often don't go with a full IP stack or something like that. And they often don't really go with end-to-end -end connectivity. So it often ends at the hub or the gateway or something, and it doesn't go to up to your the other device you're communicating with. It could be the cloud, it could be somewhere else. So that is um, also something I have in mind. And I'm also talking about mesh capabilities. So one of a few of these wireless solutions have like end-to-end -end connectivity, which is working quite well for a lot of use cases. But having mesh is like enabling a lot more um, wider nets to be available in your home, in your industry, in your factory or whatever. And I'm also talking about sleepy end devices, which is like crucial for like the low power part here. Um, some caveats here. So I'm I'm not working for the Thread Group, um, and the company I'm working for is also not a member of the Thread Group or something, right? I'm really only looking at that for like an open source solution. So I was looking around, what is available, what is like available in a form that I can integrate it easily and work with, and maybe offer to some some customers or partners or so on. Um, something so we wanted to use in the O'Neill project, but I was was looking around what is available, and that's really based on the open source stuff here. So, power budget. So the white uh, screenshot you can see here, that is from um, a white paper from the SWAT group. So how they define their like power budget and how they think OpenSWAT can be used on like small devices. So that's basically the calculations they are putting in there. The, um, so you can see like the link down below, that's the link to the white paper, that's all public available. So if you want to have all the, uh, all the details and everything like that, you can look into that. But it gives you an idea. So the, the scope they design or the, the um, sensor profile they're designing is like having a data report like every 60 seconds um, to maybe one hop or maybe a few more hops away. Um, and then checking in with the parent like every four seconds. So the checking in with the parent means the device is sleeping for the rest of the time. So that's very, very crucial for the power consumption that you have a way to like, that the parent is holding the data for you while you can sleep and then checking in every few seconds or whatever time so, uh, you want to define there. And the application data, so the payload itself, it's they define something like 36 bytes 
that should be enough for some sensor data. It might depend on a use case and so on. So take all these numbers, obviously, with a grain of salt. It has to be applied to your own use case and needs, but it's like a good baseline for you to understand what kind of things we are talking about. So the, I, I marked that up. You can see here that that is what they, they aim for, like with this kind of profile they described here. So they go with a coin cell battery with 200 milliampere, and with all the calculations they are doing, they hope to they aim for something like three years. So even if you think that like that is not what I'm using, I have more logic, I have more data or whatever, I, I wake up more often or something, even if that goes down to two years or something, I think that's still very competitive and interesting use case. You can like have your door sensor or something sitting there for two years instead of changing the battery like once a year or like every six months or something. So this is like the scope I, I want to talk about here. So how is the relation between 15.4, which is the underlying um, radio uh, spec they are using in Thread, which is basically the same they are using Zigbee? Um, so there are like a few functionalities within the spec that they are reusing in Thread to make these kind of things possible. Um, so there's like the reduced function set devices, which are designed for like sleeping and being low power and so on. Some of them, some of the ships actually have like only receive or transmit capabilities. So that's, that, that's how far down you can go. Most of the time you don't want that, you want to have both, but um, you can, if you have a very specific niche use case, there are also ships for that. And then there are things like, in 15.4, there are things like the data request uh, command to pause the parent. So that is what I meant with like waking up every four seconds, sending out this data command pull request. And in the egg that you're getting back, there's already a, a bit field where you can say like there's a frame pending, pending for you. And so then at that point you can say, okay, I need to uh, ask for all the data from my parents that is queuing up there, getting it, processing it, and then reacting in whatever way. Um, and normally, hopefully, that should be set to zero, and that means I just walk up, send out one um, frame, get the arc, pass it, go down to sleep again. So that's like how you can really efficient um, do that in, in 15.4. So this whole relationship between sleepy end devices, being a child, um, this whole relationship with the parent, a router in OpenSwert speak, that is like what uh, OpenSwert really took over. And there's also other things like you can have like short addresses. So the norm, so in 15.4 you have like short and long addresses, could be like 16 uh, bit or 64 bit. And if you want to save power, you might want to use like the 16 bit uh, addresses only in a, in a given small range that is uh, working quite well and then you don't have to transmit that much data. Again, so here you can see like one example from uh, from Nordic with like um, there was like some um, data sheets they put out for like their power consumption on the on the Nordic ships. They're using that specific example there for the, for the uh, uh, 52 uh, 840, and here you can see like the numbers they they argue with. This is kind of the, the measurements they're doing for like various setups, like sleeping, data requests, in different power uh, conditions and so on. So this is like um, to help you to understand and what, what the scope is here, basically. And yes, uh, there's a lot of other solutions and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth low energy are definitely high on the list. And they definitely have um, a very good use case. And what I'm talking about here is might just not fit well for what you want to do. So these ones might be better it really depends on the use case and the profile you're having. So they're both very well established already, so especially like finding them in, in your phones and so on. So for, for Bluetooth Smart, for example, having like an uh, accessory connection to your phone, that's like very where Bluetooth really shines because it's already there. That is something you can't do with 15.4 or something. Um, Bluetooth is like kind of on the same power budget. They're also sometimes like ships with like using the same same parts of the core, maybe even the same antenna and something like that. Like the Nordic ships, they can use like Bluetooth and 15.4, but there are other solutions as well. So that's definitely an interesting point. But you, if you're going to go, and go like full mesh and having IP over that, um, then it gets more tricky because the mesh stuff in Bluetooth is, I mean, ex it exists. It's not very widely deployed and this really has some problems here and there. Also had a lot of latency problems. If that is not a problem for your use case, go for it. It's like very well established. And the same if you have like a lot of data you want to transfer or you want to reuse existing infrastructure like in a building or something like that, Wi-Fi is always there. But you have to keep in mind power budget is very, very different. So just to be fair here and clearing that it's not like one thing to rule everything. So open thread overview. 
the threat group is like the, the governance body to do all of that. Like, so they um, develop the specification basically. So all the companies come together there, paying a fee, then you get access to the working groups and specification development. This is like behind closed doors. If you're not a member, you don't have access to that. The threat 1.1, so 1.0 as well, but 1.1 specification is publicly available. So you can get that and develop against it if you want. Members already have access to a newer one. Again, I'm not a member, so I don't have access to that. I just want to list that up here, that, that is like um, how you do it. And if you want to do certification, so you want to really get a product out that you want to be certified against threat, make sure that everything is working together, you need to be a member, you have to pay a fee and so on to do that. But for my use case, developing prototypes, developing open source software around it, it was completely fine to just go with the open thread open source project, which does exist. It's under the BSD3 license. Um, it's very active and very welcoming. You have to sign the Google CLA if you want to do upstream contributions, which is something I don't really like personally, but that's just how it is. Um, it's driven by mostly by Google and Nest employees. Um, but that doesn't mean they very actively react on feedback from the community or something like that. So that is that is good. And it's a very established code base and also used in commercial projects and so on. So it's really nice to have that available. So in Thread, you have like different device types. So I briefly mentioned that in the beginning is having like reduced function devices and also have like full function devices and so on. So that is like a full Thread device is something that can act as a, as a router and it would forward packages and always has the transceiver enabled, which is obviously impacting how the power budget is for these kind of devices. And then you have like so-called read devices, router eligible end devices that which are basically standby, uh, which are uh, routers, uh, st uh, standby device that can get a router if the network needs it to like have more, uh, a big, bigger coverage in the mesh and so on to fit, um, uh, yeah, to cover more devices and uh, the edges of it basically. And then you go down to minimal thread devices. Um, they have reduced functionality, um, are more designed for like low power and stuff like that. They are also often designed as sleepy end devices, uh, which I mentioned before, like t uh, turning the transceiver off, waking up only periodically and pull messages from the parent, described that already. And there's also something new, which I think it's not part of the 1.1 spec. I see that they started to implement it in OpenThread, so I would expect it to be like in one of the newer specs, which is a synchronized schedule with the parents, so synchronized sleepy devices. The key point here is uh, that this needs a newer spec for the lower layers, the 15.4 layer. So it does normally sp uh, Thread needs like the 2006 edition, this is really old. So normally all of the hardware would, uh, would work with that. But for this one, you would need a, sp a specific part called uh, coordinated sample listening. Um, so that is part of the spec and the hardware need to support that and so on. So this is something you keep in mind, but it could help to have like synchronized schedules with your parent and even save a bit more battery then. You also have different device roles. I touched on that uh, with like the, the, the router, the router being like forwarding packets um, and holding packets for um, as a parent for the child. So it's queuing them up so until it wakes up. This always have to be in reason, obviously. So you can't go ahead and say your child only wakes up like once a year and you expect the, the router to uh, queue all the, uh, the packets and everything that has been waiting for it. So that's not going to happen. Um, but within reason, that is, that is working well. Then you have the end devices. Uh, they normally only uh, communicate with, with their parent, with the router. And then, um, yeah, that is, uh, but it, uh, you can disable the radio if you want. Um, yeah. Then you have the, the thread leader, which is basically like coordinating all the different routers in the network, making sure that all the network information is distributed equally, uh, making sure that new devices can be commissioned into the network. I leave a lot of stuff out here because that's would really go into a lot of details, but Thread is also allowing you to like how you commission a device into the network. It has uh, a protocol called mesh li uh, link establishment to make sure that all the links in the mesh networks are keep working and so on. So that is all like handled by the Thread leader to make sure that's distributed. Um. And then you have uh, a border router, which would be a device which has on the one hand uh, a link to a Thread network, on the other hand have a link to a non-Thread network and then being able to like route packets back and forth. This could be like, um, Commonly things are like the Apple TV and the uh, Apple iPod, uh, uh, this pod thing, I don't know what the name is, the speaker, whatever. So they have like devices, they have like Wi-Fi on the one side and uh, thread on the other side. And they would make sure that the packets are getting forwarded then back to, back to the cloud or just in your home or something like that, wherever you want it. 
and um, you you're not bound to one so you can have like several border routers in your home network which is great because if you like turn off your um, Apple TV or something like that then the thread network can just go over the other border router and still be in communication so you don't have a single point of failure at that point going to addressing so it's IP version 6 based um, they have like different scopes for the addressing here. So they have like the link local, which are all the directly reachable uh, devices, the different nodes, and they are all within the FA uh, AT IP version 6 prefix. They also have a mesh local prefix, so that's like for all the devices in the mesh network. They have a dedicated IP version 6 prefix for that as well. And then you have like a global address that can be, depending on the setting of your your network uh, can be reached either from the whole internet or it can be isolated or something like that. So it could be like isolated for your, your campus, your home, your factory, or it can really reach out to like whatever server in the cloud where you want to put your data on or not. Right? It's really depending on how you, how you set that up. If you want to go into more details of all the um, addressing, um, so that also has a, something called routing locator, ALOC, um, which they use very cleverly to like identify the nodes within the uh, network topology in the network. So I, I don't go into that, it's going too far, but um, this is something could be interesting if you want to know about that. Again, I put a link into that, so there's a, a guide about the thread primer from, from OpenThread where they talk about that in a bit more detail and also give links for further reformation. So give me a moment. Ah, that's better. So, talking about open thread, the open source project, what kind of components do we have here? So we have, uh, that it's all sitting on GitHub, and we have like one core repository called open thread. It's a core, impl uh, it's a core implementation, a little, little of tools around it and so on, and also like the open thread daemon, uh, which is like an, a native POSIX service you can run on a Linux if you want. And then you have like a load of different extra repositories where all the vendors can support their own socks, their own chipsets and so on and make sure that that is working. So this can be used for like the bare metal scenario where you run OpenThread and then combine that with one of these repositories and run bare metal. So the basically what these repositories are like are the hall or the SDK from the vendor and then integrating that with OpenThread. So you can have like a use case for that. There's also a repository called OT Autos, which is based on free Autos together with the LWIP uh, networking stack. I um, haven't seen a lot of work going on there recently, so I think it's like a bit on a, in a maintenance state or something, um, but it's, it is there. And then there's the OTBR POSIX repo, which is the full implementation of a, of a border router on the Linux side, which takes most of the open source repository, like the OT daemon and so on, then has all the glue around it to make all the, the services work and so on. And then there's an older thing called WPEN TAN, that's, which is used for network co-processing interfacing. Um, I, I come to that in a, in a moment. So, and then, in addition to that, there's also the integration of OpenSwet as a module into Zephyr, so Zephyr as an Artos. Um, they basically take the main repository and like add all the glue code you might need to make it work together with OpenSwet, and that is uh, something I've been using in, in, my, in my work. So bare metal with Artos versus Linux. Um, I'll just make that short. Um, there are use cases for all of these, definitely. Um, Bare metal, obviously, if you if you are sure you want to only go with a specific chipset, you have a very good relation with your vendor, for example, and uh, you want to go to a really, really minimal approach, you might want to go that route. You can bring the price down if you go like high volume and stuff like that. It's normally, it's, it's a SOC design. It's, uh, you normally go for like sleepy anti-vices and minimal anti-vices, and it's normally battery powered. So really, you optimize for price here. Um, you lose, obviously, flexibility. Um, if you go for an Atos, um, you have you maybe need a, a more pricey ship because you need more RAM and so on. Um, but then you have more flexibility. Maybe have you already have an application that running on an Atos you want to bring over some business logic or whatever, right? So you 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 have to trade uh, weigh it off here. And there's uh, as I said, there's OT Atos and OpenThread uh, and Zephyr to use that. And you can do all kind of designs for that. You can go from sleepy devices up to like a full router. Um, I think I even saw like a solution with on Zephyr side with uh, being a full border router um, with some sort. Um, 
I don't know if I would do that, but it seems to be possible. And as I said, the use cases means that you can either be um, battery or main powered at that point. The Linux side, on the other hand, you normally would not go and make that just an end device. You could do that. I mean, there's something like OT Damien, which can basically just act as an end device if you want to. Um, and there's the full setup with uh, OT border router. Um, and then there's like two scenarios how you would use that. There's like the RCP and the NCP. So it's a radio coprocessor and the networking coprocessor. The main difference here being like how much of the thread stack is actually operating on the firmware on the radio side and how much is sitting on the Linux side. So the network coprocessor, there's almost all of the uh, thread stuff is sitting in the, in the radio firmware. And um, I mean, you still have control over that if you build it yourself and so on. But on the uh, radio uh, coprocessor is more like more of the logic is sitting on the on the Linux side. So that is right now RCP is a bit more like in favor of this OTBR and so on. But again, depending on your use case, how you want to do that. But these devices are normally main powered. I mean, you could have like a Linux machine with like a big battery attached to it. You could do that, but normally I would expect these things to be like main powered. Okay, so. Going to the technologies that are used in OpenThread. Um, one of these things, one of the key things they are using is six low pan. So six low pan, what is it? So it's like really like decades ago, people wanted to do like low wireless, uh, low power wireless as well. But at that point, everybody said like TCP IP, that's just a waste of, uh, uh, um, uh, just wasteful, right? We don't want to do that. We have like our own solution. We have our silos. We have like one vertical use case only where we go and we want to develop that and we don't care about like working with other vendors, other systems and so on. So that worked for a while. Um, and to be fair, at that point, the ships obviously haven't had like enough resources for all of that. But around 2003, they started to look a bit more into like micro IP uh, stacks to get that into microcontrollers see what they can do there, but at that point the focus was obviously more like trying to get it working at all and not so much uh, focusing on frame size and like um, deployability and stuff like that. So in uh, 2003 also the first uh, 15.4 standard have been kicked off and that drove a lot of like academics but also like industry to like look into how that could maybe use for, uh, for low rate, low power with IP. And in 2007, they started to have like uh, IT RFCs that actually define how you would do that. So six low pen is an RFC um, that helps you to like transmit IP version six over 15.4 frames. And by now, there has been a lot of like uh, new RFCs coming out of that. So six low pen was uh, so 15.4 was the first one, but they also adapted it for Bluetooth, NFC, PLC, and other things. I think I missed a lot here. Okay, so what is it in a nutshell? So what Six low pen is offering you is like it offers you one encapsulation and second header compression. So it is sitting as an adaption layer between link layer and the original networking layer. So it's sitting in between, and that normally means because for like IP6 you need like 1,280 bytes like as a maximum packet size that might be used, and that is clashing very much with like the 127 byte maximum transfer unit that 15.4 has. So that's like a definitely a mismatch. So at that point you needed to bring back like fragmentation which was not not really uh, seen like needed for IP version 6 anymore so they bring that back in the encapsulation frame. You still should avoid it if possible so if you design your upper layers um, and you can avoid it to like send too much data that end up in fragmentation because it can ha have like bad performance in a lossy network but it's still it is possible to do. The second part is the header compression. So IP version 6 has like um, a 40 byte header you would need to put in there. And if you see like 127 byte is the MTU, that means 40 byte of that is like a huge chunk already taken just for a header for one of the protocols, right? So what they uh, implemented or what they specified is was like how they can reduce the size of the IP version 6 header and maybe also the header coming along like UDP and so on. So that's what they what they done, and there have been a lot of iterations around that. So you have like header compression one, header compression two, IP header compression, next header compression, generic header compression. So it a lot of these things going on. Um, the first one, the first two are no longer used, but the rest is still in use somehow. So to demonstrate that a little bit, um, you go ahead and like have like a scenario where you have like your frame header that can be like. So I'm taking like the worst case scenario here, right? So 25 bytes is a frame header itself. Then you want to have like um, link uh, security 
already enabled for AES encryption, stuff like that. In 15.4, that is something the spec supports. You want that, so it's 25, 21 bytes gone as well. Then you put the raw uh, IPv6 header in, uh, 40 bytes, then UDP, and, and you end up with like 33 bytes of payload, which is a very bad ratio for like for one frame to get a bit data through, which is obviously not not ideal. Um, so what IPv6 is in a nutshell here, right? So the IP header compression, it looks what kind of fields in the uh, IPv6 header are available and which we really need, and the other ones we don't need, we can just screw, right? So like the, the version. It is always six because we now we only transfer uh, IPv6 headers there. The traffic class and the flow label we, we set to zero, we ignore that. It is a limitation, but it's something we are willing to pay at that point. And for like um, the hop limit, for example, instead of having the full range, we are only having like well-known values, like 164 and stuff like that. So it's really reducing the, the scope and the, the number of bytes we need to do there. The length field, again, can be coming from the fragmentation header or it can come from the data link header. Yes, I know that it's kind of a layer violation if you want to look at it like that, but that is what really helping it to like um, make it work and make it work in a very good way, basically. Um, so, but the other big saving is to um, don't have like the big IPv6 addresses transmitted all the time. This is depending a little bit on the network is set up and what uh, what the uh, what the other end is for the communication. So how much of the prefix you have to um, integrate into that. But if it's linked local, um, the prefix is known by the network, so you can elite that, and the um, the rest of the local address is basically just a part of the uh, MAC address from the device itself, which is coming from the L um, L2 already. So you can reuse that as well. So you can elite all of that if you want. And then you end up with um, six bytes instead of the 48 or something we had before with, uh, with UDP and IPv6. Uh, IP so again, something we didn't change here is like the frame header and the um, link security. That is still all the same, but the red stuff is that what we reduced down. And that means we have like um, payload up to 75 bytes, which is quite good at that point. So the ratio is a lot better. Some miscellaneous tips. I mentioned that before, if you can avoid it, design your upper layers in a way that they are not uh, resulting in fragmentation of, uh, so really make sure that you can fit it in one frame if possible. For sensor data that might be enough, for others not. It is working, it's not like so dramatic or something, but if you have a lossy network where some frames are getting lost, it can it really have an impact. Also initially, um, there was a big push forwards to avoiding TCP, um, having the three-way handshake, the latency involved with that, with all the TLS and so on. There was a big push of going just for UDP and DTLS. Um, by now, there is support for TCP in OpenThread, and it is working better now. There are some solutions, some people on the uh, in Berkeley University, they have been like working on like how can they co can optimize that and so on. So it's working better now, um, but yeah, you, you have to make your trade-offs there as well. And then again, there's like uh, spe uh, uh, um, protocols like co-op, like constrained application protocol, also designed uh, designed by ITF for these kind of networks. But you don't have to use that. So there are other ones you can you can go with. Okay. So the next thing um, I wanted to look a little bit into because that's like related to power budget, power management, and so not power management. Sorry, for like the power budget for the whole network, basically. So, okay. Thanks. Um, so there's like multicast DNS discovery proxy, which has have been developed, and there's a service registration protocol. So the first one is already in IT, it's already in a spec, it's already there, and the idea is to avoid sending the multicast traffic you are having into the threat network, because in the threat network that is broadcast. That means every device gets it. It might get filtered out on the on the hardware filter or it might get filtered out really early in the stack, but still there might be some processing. In, and in the end, this data is, that's wasted and battery, uh, battery is, uh, cycles that are wasted to, to do that, right? So what multicast, uh, what, the, what the discovery proxy is doing, it really it's reaching out, finding all these kind uh, of uh, services are available and offering them over unicast. So basically you can reach out, do that on the thread network and have the proxy sitting on the water router and that would allow you to have like unicast traffic only to the one device you want to talk with and then do all the data communication you are going to do and instead of like broadcasting to all the traffic. This is really what reduces it down basically. And 
uh, together with that, there's the service registration protocol. This is still a draft and development, but there was the idea coming, I think also coming from the thread uh, people, um, that they wanted to have like a way of register that with the, with the Borla router directly. So the small end node would say, I have a service, but I don't want to be, um, 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 want to be available all the time to like react on that. So I register myself, I'm here, and then I can get waking up and then have the transfer going on. All of this is optimization. You don't have to do that. Um, and the end-to-end -end paradigm from IP version 6 is still working. So when I initially thought about, talked about like the history of uh, 6 Lope and stuff like that, where you had like a vertical stacks and no interoperability with others and so on, that was like often the case because you have like an application level proxy where you would have like doing all the handling and so on. This is not the case here. There's no interruption or something like that. It's still the same. Which brings me to what I've been doing like on the last year, uh, working on a, a transparent gateway blueprint. Transparent here is a part where I say there's the end-to-end -end paradigm, it's still standing, so you don't have anything in between. You want to have maybe a firewall or some rules or something like that, but the, the rest is still there. So that's something I've been working on for, for the neural project. So the idea was to have like a Wi-Fi access point, have like um, Ethernet obviously connected, and then you have like a border router on the, uh, m um, to, uh, to host your mesh and stuff like that. Uh, on the Linux side, and then you have like small end devices, in our case with Zephyr, to also run OpenThread to either be like driving whatever application, so a door lock and stuff like that. So we, we toyed around with various things here. So here you can see a picture of what I did there. So it's I try to use like very common devices that are easy available on the shelf. So it's the Raspberry Pi 4. And then you have like here, this is an Arduino device with a Nordic chipset, which is very well supported in Zephyr. And here's another uh, Nordic device as a USB dongle, which acts as the radio coprocessor, basically. Um, so the idea was really to like start a bit fresh, take modern technologies that we have, and, and try to develop something in that space that, that might be interesting for our partners. So the current demo is like based on OpenThread, on Open. Um, it's all done and built with Yocto. Uh, all the receipts I did for that are upstreamed already. Um, Zephyr side as well, all the, we didn't really have to do much fixes, but what we did is upstreamed already. Um, they are very active working on that. So we have like demos for like the application, Zephyr application acting like that, as well as the Linux side for having like the whole setup bring up. So that is all, all the integration, so it's working. And it's basically also a very nice kind of a turnkey solution by, because the Thread Group is offering, offering an um, Android application that allows you to onboard devices. So that is why you have the, uh, the, uh, uh, the barcode here, or the QR code here. So that means for, uh, I take like the thread, dongle, uh, the thread device out of box and want to onboard it to my network. Um, so what I can do is like either on the packaging, on the device itself, I have the QR code, I scan that, the mobile app initiates the commissioning with the, with the border router, and then it like integrates the device on the network without even the networking key never leaving like the network itself. So it's getting transferred over. And then the device is onboard into the network and then have all the IP connectivity it wants to have. Just one more thing about uh, matters. It's an upcoming standard. It's um, interesting because it uses thread and it's also designed in the, um, as an application layer protocol on top of that. Um, it is also an open source implementation of that. The spec itself and the SDK to be like 1.0 is expected to come later this year. I don't know at what point it will happen or not, but it's, it's designed by the Connectivity Standards Alliance, which was formerly the Zigbee Alliance. So that's like they still do Zigbee, but it matters like the next big thing, what they're planning on. And it's basically a lot of big players going in there, like whatever, Apple, Amazon, Google, you name it, they're all there. The interesting part here saw is that um, they have a mechanism called multi-admin, and what they aim for is having like devices connected to multiple platforms. So that means I bring in my device in my home network, and whatever, I have an Android phone, I want to con uh, control it with Google Home or something, or my brother wants to control it with uh, um, what's the Apple thing called, like HomeKit or something, right? It should, in theory, work with all of them. So that's one of the promises they are doing. You have to see if that holds up or not, that you have to see in practice, but I think it's very interesting. And for me, obviously, it's interesting because it allows like these whole mechanisms of having like sleepy end device and something like that, that goes from the bottom up to open thread into matter as well to really make sure that you have like a door sensor that can live, live for like two years or something like that. And with that, 
I'm closing down. Thank you for your attention. Also, thank you the internet for your attention. And we have a Huawei boost down. I'm sometimes there if you want to catch me, or maybe we have a few minutes left. I don't know. Okay, so questions. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, one of them was the provisioning of new devices. Okay. Uh, so what was the dynamic changes to the network, the mesh network? Mm -hmm. It's very large. It is. Yeah. It's also very costly. So to give it to a customer to install it, uh, for example, on his own, is not that good. Okay. So I mean, I've seen it like running for customers in deployments and so on. So it is possible. It is more like yeah. Okay. If it's an irrigation customer or whatever, it's too much. Okay, that's a fair point. That's going to that, that's going to change in some way, right? Or yeah, I mean that's definitely going that direction. But as I said, I don't know. We have to see how, what what it really holds up to. I mean that's the expectations we have. But if it really brings that, or not. Yeah. yeah. But it's a fair point. Good. Thank you. Okay. Second issue uh, I had with it is the range. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you're using like mesh, Bluetooth, yeah, Bluetooth mesh. mesh. Okay, so but I'm and the. Installing repeaters in the middle. I want to send the range okay. above the uh, 30, 40 meters of the uh, repeater. And you had no no problems with latency and stuff like that for the application you're you're yeah, having there. Or latency is not an issue if I need range. So. Yeah, depending on use case, obviously. Yeah, but I, it's good to know. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Over there. Not at all. I, I can talk. Uh, no, I can talk about it, but it's not fitting in at all. So um, I'm the co. <laughs> Villard. Okay. So my okay. That that's not part of the presentation. But yeah, I'm I'm the co-system maintainer of 5.4 on Linux, and I obviously have an interest in that. Um, one thing could be to have like an uh, abstraction, hardware abstraction in OpenThread to run that instead of like going through all the spinner stuff and so on, talking to your radio coprocessor, you would go directly and talk to the radios, to the Linux subsystem and so on. I've been thinking about that. There haven't been any work done yet. Um, I would love to do it, but it's um, more like a spare time thing or something. So um, yeah, it's on my personal to-do list. I don't know when I come to it, so no problem. Okay, so time for one more question. Okay, nobody? Okay, thanks again. Thanks again for your attention and bye-bye. <laughs>